I want to talk about three things that God gave me. Are you doing okay? Here's the statements that God gave me. The first one, under the spiritual reality of the church, the first one was this, that prayer meetings are greater than board meetings. I'll just let this sink in for a moment. Prayer meetings are greater than board meetings. Again, am I saying there's no place for board meetings, elders meetings, leaders meetings? No, I'm saying that prayer meetings are greater than board meetings. I'm saying that prayer is greater than any other meeting that we can have. And I want to I lean into this. And I pray that, again, you hear what the Spirit wants to say. In Matthew 21, verse 13, a scripture you might know quite well, Jesus, quoting from Isaiah, says, It is written, and if you know this when I say it, feel free to finish it with me. Jesus himself said, My house will be called a house of... Say it with me. My house, not just right there, Jesus speaking. My house, not your house. It's my church. It's not your church. Can I say something really loving but really direct? There are no place in the church for Christians to be pointing at things going, I don't like this, I don't like this. It's not your house. Come on. We're arguing about our preferences rather than saying, God, what are you doing? Come on, let's be a part of that. God is really stirring something in my spirit right now. He gave me a picture some years back about if people come to my house and they come and visit Sally and I and they walk in there, what would I think if they walked in there and they saw my lounge room and go, hang on, I don't like the TV there. What do you put? No, pick it up. Put it over here. Put your TV over here. That couch, what do you got the couch facing that way? Turn the And they started to organize my house. Do you? What, come on, we laugh and go, that's ludicrous. So why do we do it in the body of Christ? Jesus said, it's my house. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Our, 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 if we're going to ask something, let's ask the Lord, what are you doing? What do you want me to be a part of? Come on, the spiritual reality of the church. He says, I'm building my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that I am building. He says, and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. Notice he says, I'll give you the keys. I'll give you that which unlocks and locks. Come on, that which looses and binds, that which shifts something in the spirit realm. But I'll do the building of it. That's good news pressure off me come on I, I don't have to change your mind tonight I've just gotta I've just gotta keep in step with the spirit and download what God has called me to do we've got to actually get a bit of greater clarity on what God is calling us to do and what God has said he will do he will build his church and he'll give us keys that unlock things in the spirit realm. Because why? The church is a spiritual reality, not a natural reality. We don't build a church. God builds the church. But we co-labor, co-partner with him in the spirit realm. And it starts with prayer meetings are greater than board meetings. Because Jesus said, my house, my house that I am building, it will be called. Everyone say called. Everyone shout it out, called. Jesus said, it will be called a house of prayer. Let me make a couple statements and then just lean into this for a few minutes before I go into the next thing here. God said to me that prayer is our greatest partnership with God. Church, prayer is our greatest partnership with God, but it is our least pursued because we measure incorrectly. Hmm. Because we have made it too much about what we do for God rather than it being about what we do with God. Leading, serving in the church is not about what we can do for God. Come on. We're talking about the one who created everything from nothing. He doesn't need our help. Have you thought about this? I love what it says. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that without faith it's impossible to please God. And we need to understand, there's, we can please God, but we can't impress God. You can't impress God. I can't impress God. How much I do for God doesn't impress God. He made everything from nothing in six days. My best can't impress Him. 
but I can please him. Come on. I can please him. And God, I want to be about my father's business. Jesus said at the age of 12, and I believe it's a great statement for us all here today. God, I'm not here to build my own thing. I want to be about my father's business. Prayer is our greatest partnership with God. I remember the day where God was talking to me about the importance of prayer in the life of the church. And when I say the church, how many people here are the church? It's not a trick question. <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a believer, you're the church. So if you're a believer, I want to see your hand right now. You're the church. The church is not a building. The church is the ecclesia, literally in the Greek, the called out ones. Anyone called out? Anyone caught out of death into life? Come on. Allow yourself to be happy right now. Anyone caught out of slavery into freedom? Out of darkness into light? Is anyone called out? Come on. You're caught out. See, there's a natural calling out that's negative. When people call someone out, it's like they call you out and they shame you. God doesn't call you out to shame you. He calls you out of shame. Come on. Into healing and health and wholeness. We are a called out people. That's who the church of Jesus Christ is. It's a spiritual reality. And God says, my church will be called a house of prayer. The first thing that should come to people's mind when they think about you and I is, oh, they're praying people. Hmm. This is challenging, church. This is challenging because we're so busy for God that sometimes we're disobeying that which he says, this is what I want you identified as. God brought this home to me in a very confronting way. One day when I was driving down the road, God's just downloading to me. I said, I want my house to be called a house of prayer. And we're doing all these things with a bit of prayer sprinkled on top. But I've called my people to be a house of prayer. And I'm driving down the road and I drive past, past a church. And God says, what is that? And I'm driving and I said, oh, it's a house of worship. It's a house of belonging place of discipleship, a place of preaching, sending, missions. As I keep driving, I drove past the mosque and God said, what's that? And I said, oh my gosh, it's a house of prayer. And the Lord spoke to me and I felt the emotion. He goes, but I said, I want my house to be called a house of prayer. And then he said to me, the counterfeit can only move in when there is a void in my intention. I, I pray you're hearing the seriousness, the weightiness of this. The count of it can only move in when there's a void. Isn't that what happened even when Jesus cast out the demon, the, 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 or sorry, the, the, the apostles cast out the, the demon of that person and they said, you, you've got to make sure now you, you fill that with the right stuff because otherwise it will come around or come back with seven mates and fill this thing up. It will, it will come back round again. Jesus said, my house. Can we, can, we, can we just lean in for a moment? Is that all right, church? No mosque, no temple, no, no other religion. No, my house, my people will be called house of prayer. I want to declare by the spirit of the living God that God is calling us as a people. Turning Point Church, Stephen Sally McCrack, and the body of Christ globally, the most important thing about your life when it comes to your identification is are you a person of prayer? How is your personal prayer life? Because I want to say it again. It's our greatest partnership with God, but sometimes we made it more about what we do for Him. I remember listening to Dr. David Yonggi Cho. Anyone heard of him? He was the man who was the pastor of the largest church in the world. And the North Korea there, and he had uh, literally hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands. And I heard him speak on prayer. And he said this, and I was in the meeting, and it, it, it just hit me here, and the Lord's brought it back to me. He says... The problem with your board meetings, and he was talking board, elders, just leaders meetings. He goes, the problem with your board meetings is you've made them business meetings and they're meant to be prayer meetings. Here's a man who's leading a church of hundreds of thousands. Can you think about how many issues they need to talk through? Can, can we get real, just a bit real for a moment? 
We might have hundreds in our church or thousands in our church, and we go, ah, endless. He's got hundreds of thousands. And this is what he said. He said, what we do is when we get together, we start to pray. We start to pray, and then we pray some more. And then we pray some more. And we press in to hear the mind of God, and we pray some more, listening to God. To the time when God says, okay, you can stop now. And then the business takes 40 minutes. It gripped me in that moment. Maybe God knows what he's talking about. The largest church in the world. And they said, if we're going to do something, we're going to pray. Because why? The church is a spiritual bride to be formed. It's a spiritual reality. And Jesus himself said, I want my house to be called a house of prayer. Do you receive it? So how is your personal prayer life? And how is your commitment to corporate prayer. What is the corporate prayer life of a turning point church? What corporate prayer meetings do we have and are you there? This is not legalism. Don't take legalism. I'm just putting before us what I feel the Lord. I don't know the state and culture of the church uh, here and of your individual personal life, but I feel the weightiness in the spirit. God says, I, I want to build my church, but I'm going to do it through a praying people, not just a preparing people. Do you receive this? God is going to do some, what happens if we get together and say, let's just pray. And don't just pray for what we're doing. Pray Come on, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Start to worship, adore him, and then allow him to lay upon your heart that which he wants you to partner with him in prayer. We've got to ensure that our prayers are not focused on us asking God to do for us what we want, but we're saying, God, what's on your heart? Come on, we're going to partner and say, amen, amen, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, in Jesus' name. And what part does faith have in your prayer life personally and corporately? That's the questions God gave me. What part does faith have? Because how many people know that you can pray, I can pray, we can pray, and we just pray because it's the right thing to do. God, would you bless us to do this? What part does faith have? That, that, that deep, unshakable trust and confidence in God. That he's going to do something supernatural and miraculous. So the first thing is that the prayer means greater than the board meetings. The second thing is that the truth is greater than our opinions. The truth is greater than our opinions. This is talking about the spiritual reality of the church. And I want to take us to John 8, 31 and 32. It says, To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to what? my teachings if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples anyone here a disciple of jesus christ the answer is if we hold to his teachings we're a disciple of jesus christ this is a word for the for the church in the world right now because i i i i want to make a statement in a moment But I I want to keep on reading this. If you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. You're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. If you hold to my teaching, you'll know the truth. Can we preach together for a moment? If you hold to my teaching, says Jesus, you'll know the truth. I want to tell you right now, if we're not holding to Jesus' teaching, then we don't know the truth. But if we're holding to Jesus' teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. And freedom is connected to holding and knowing the truth. The truth is found in God's word. What God has said, what God has authored as we talked about this morning. And God has been speaking to me. And he said, even this week, the greatest attack from the enemy right now is the eradication of truth. That was his language to me. It's pretty strong, isn't it, Phil? Eradication of truth. It's not he wants to come and just amend it and and dilute it. He literally wants to eradicate it, which means the complete destruction of something. 
the enemy's plan at the moment and it's coming even through laws and governments and everything else and in the world and the and people trying to um, dictate the narrative and say if you've got a different opinion than me then you're wrong and and you're this and you're that I want to come and call it out as it is and I want to declare by the Spirit of God that it is the plan of the enemy to completely eradicate the truth But God says, if you hold to my teaching, then you will know the truth and the truth will actually set you free. Oh, the people that are fighting against this whole thing of truth, all under the guise of its freedom. It's actually slavery and bondage. Freedom can only be found when we do things God's way. That's where freedom is. And the moment truth becomes subjective, it is no longer truth. The word subjective literally means based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinion. Does that sound like the culture of our time? It says based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. That's subjective. The moment truth is subjective, well, that's your truth, Steve. It's not my truth. No, I don't pick truth. You don't pick truth. God determines truth. And I've said it before, our part, our responsibility is not to determine truth, it's actually to discover truth. And that happens by revelation, by what God has said. Praise the name of Jesus. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. I want to say we can't be a disciple of Jesus if we're not holding to the purity of Jesus' teaching. I'm seeing an increasing amount in the body of Christ that are stating things different to what the Word says, but they say, but I'm good with God and God's good with me. Can I say disciples hold to the purity of the teaching of Jesus Christ? Even when Jesus was speaking it, many struggled with it, didn't they? And he didn't come and lower the bar. He says, come on, you, you, you heard it said don't murder. I'm saying you don't even hate someone. You heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm saying, don't even lust after someone. Come on. I'm not getting rid of it and saying whatever goes. Grace doesn't say whatever goes. Grace is the empowerment to do what actually God authored us to do and called us to do. Grace is the empowerment to walk in the truth that actually sets us free. I want to say, if you want to be free, come on, lean into the grace of God so that we can live according to His truth. Hallelujah. So how's your commitment? How's your commitment to truth no matter what? Again, the spiritual reality, the spiritual reality of the church is ones that hold on to the truth. The truth of what God has declared something to be. God, empower us to do this. And how is your pursuit of gaining spiritual understanding through divine revelation that is founded on God's declared word? And that leads me to the last thing I want to say here tonight under the the fact, the spiritual reality of the church. And that is this, that faith is greater than understanding. Praying is a greater than board means the truth is greater than our opinions and faith faith is greater than understanding this is a real key one when it comes to the spiritual reality of your life and of my life in proverbs 3 verse 5 how many people know what it says i'll start it for you if you know it join me trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I I need you to lean in for a few minutes. We're almost done here. This is is a make or break right now. I said it this morning. There, there, There is a, oh, there's a, one of the great, and this is a, this is a hard thing I'm about to say, but one of the great evils of the day that is derailing a lot of people is the pursuit of knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of understanding. 
The Bible even says a little knowledge can puff you up. We pride ourselves on what we know, all the while missing the God who wants us to know Him. And I was drawn to this scripture here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. A lot of people, maybe you included, myself included, sometimes we just want to understand. Anyone been there? That's okay. But this is what God showed me. You cannot trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding at the same time. It's one or the other. Uh, <laughs> is this okay if we just get really real as we're finishing? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. No, trust in the Lord. Don't lean on that. This is saying it's either or. Hmm. Come on. We've got to be okay with not being okay. We've got to be okay with not knowing and not understanding. We don't have to have any answer if we know the answer. If we know the God who knows all. The things of God cannot be naturally understood. And I feel God is saying and stirring our hearts right now. That's got to be okay with us. I'm not saying we don't know anything about God, anything about truth. I'm saying that, saying, I don't know, but God is good. I, I trust Him. I mean, look at the example of some of the people in the Bible that had promises of God, and then they're thrown in the lion's den or fiery furnaces or they're they're sold into slavery. They're falsely accused of rape. They're imprisoned. They, 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 can you imagine the questions? Can we be, but no, I trust you, God. I mean, Joseph said in Genesis 45, after he finally reveals himself to his brothers, he says, yes, you sold me, but God was sending me. He's got this divine revelation that what others do and what happens to me is not the greatest thing about my life. The sovereignty in my life is who I'm submitted to. And I'm submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. The pinnacle of faith is our unshakable trust in God. So my question to you is, how is your faith in the Lord when you do not understand? How is your confident trust in God when it doesn't make sense? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on, rely on. That word lean on in the Hebrew literally means to hold you up like leaning on a, on a crutch or on a frame. Supporting you. Don't allow your understanding to be what lifts you up and supports you. No, I trust in the Lord. And finally, how are your steps of faith as a kingdom minded people? Turning point church, every person here in this room, you individually in your life, how are your steps of faith as a kingdom minded people? I'm talking about the spiritual reality of our lives. My dad has always said this this, this insightful statement, everybody wants to walk on water, but not many people want to get out of the boat. I want the testimony, God, but oh, I don't want to go through that. I want to say that, I, I, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to pray. That as you read God's word this week, your eyes will be opened afresh to the spiritual reality of your life. And of this church, the spiritual reality of prayer that is the greatest partnership with God. The spiritual reality of the truth of what God has said that leads us into freedom. And also the spiritual reality that faith is so much greater than understanding. God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that you and I could ask or imagine according to his power can you see it's spiritual that is at work within us to him be glory 
in the church and in Christ Jesus. I want to finish with this statement. God already gets glory in Christ Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Come on. He gets glory in Christ because Christ, he, he got to the point, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to take these steps of faith. I'm going to move beyond just even my natural understanding. I'm going to trust you, Father, that this plan is going to work out for your glory. And he says, I want glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Now I declare by the Spirit of God that it is time that God wants to get glory in the church. And that's when we take steps of faith and go beyond understanding when God tells you to do something church we're going to do it here's the process when God speaks this is the process he says I want you to do this we say yes Lord and then we say God how do you want to do this we do not say hear God speak and then say hmm is that going to work at the moment? Do we have the finances for that at the moment? Do we have the people? Uh, that's probably not going to work. How about God, we come back and look at that some other time. Can I just say that's not stewardship, that's disobedience. God is looking for some people that put themselves into positions that if God doesn't come through, we're sunk. But do you know what happens? When he comes through, guess who gets the glory? Oh, we are a spiritual people. Everyone say, I'm a spiritual person. And the church is a spiritual reality. In Jesus' name. Well, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you right now that we have the absolute privilege of being part of what you're doing on this earth. God, open our eyes to the spiritual reality. The spiritual reality that prayer changes things. And Lord, we say, Lord, we want to be called this house of prayer for all nations. Lord, we want to be people, Lord, that when we gather together, Lord, it's not about just getting through some songs or having uh, a good meeting, but Lord, we pray that this place will go to a whole new level of people encountering God. We cry out that you will pour out your spirit again in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord, that faith is greater than understanding. The truth is greater than opinions. And Lord, we say tonight, Lord, we want to be people that look in the Spirit, see in the Spirit, hear in the Spirit, and be a part of what you're doing as you build your church. In Jesus' name, amen.